Many people are suffering from acute and chronic infections. Does hyperbaric oxygen help at all in terms of supporting those patients or even fighting those infections? And if it does, what might some of those protocols look like? That is what we're gonna cover in today's video. So recently I put out a video talking about using protocols for hyperbaric oxygen and specifically what I said was, I don't like using protocols for hyperbaric oxygen for specific conditions. Not because it's inappropriate, but because the potential for these protocols range greatly. And we need to take a protocol concept or a protocol guideline and then apply that concept to each person because every case is gonna be different. The severity is going to be different. The chronicity is going to be different. Other comorbidities that this patient has, how healthy or not is this patient when we're applying the therapy. And so typically I do not like to give specific protocols for conditions, but we can certainly talk about guidelines as a place to start the thought process and then modify that protocol accordingly based on the person and how we're trying to help support them. With regard to anaerobic infections, this is a no-brainer. We've been using hyperbaric oxygen, even in traditional medicine, in traditional hyperbarics for anaerobic infections for over 70 years. This includes infections like gas gangrene, necrotizing fasciitis, cerebral abscesses, and recurrent osteomyelitis. We know that hyperbaric oxygen helps patients with these conditions. How does it do that? What's the rationale for using hyperbaric oxygen for anaerobic infections? Well, number one, these are anaerobic infections. What does that mean? Anaerobic infections means that the bacteria we're talking about live in a, either a low or a no oxygen environment. So right away, by upregulating systemic oxygen, we know that we're creating an environment that is very non-conducive or inhospitable to their growth. Therefore, these bacterial species cannot live, grow, and thrive in this high oxygen environment. Next, we know that a lot of these anaerobic infections live under what's called biofilms. Biofilms are a substance that these bacteria typically secrete that they then shield themselves with to make a very low oxygen or a hypoxic environment because that's really where they thrive. More recent studies have shown that hyperbaric oxygen helps to break down those biofilms, exposing the bacteria not only to the oxygen environment that we're creating, but also any other therapy that we might be using to try to kill the infection, be that natural or herbal supplementation or antibiotics or whatever other therapies that we're trying to use to kill this infection. On the other side, in addition to helping kill the bacteria, hyperbaric oxygen also supports the person in a variety of different ways. We know that hyperbaric oxygen is gonna improve the immune system function, making the white blood cells, which are basically the army that we have to fight infection, work more efficiently and effectively. We also know that hyperbaric oxygen is gonna help reduce the cytokine response and all of the inflammation associated with the infection. We also know that one of the mechanisms of hyperbaric oxygen is to inhibit toxin release from these microorganisms. In other words, Part of the issue is the infection itself, but another part of the issue in many infections is that these bacterial species are releasing toxicity into our system that's either destroying tissue or creating some of the inflammatory response. And we know that hyperbaric oxygen actually inhibits the toxin release from many of these anaerobic species. So between the active shifting of the oxygen environment and the killing of the infection, along with the supporting aspects of improving immune function, blocking toxins, and reducing inflammation, hyperbaric oxygen has been used very successfully for anaerobic infections. However, it's really only been utilized in traditional hyperbarics and for very severe, often either life-threatening or limb-threatening conditions. We'll get right back to that video, but real quick, if you're a practitioner or you're looking to get into hyperbarics and you're wanting to learn more and making sure that you're offering this therapy as effectively and as safely as possible, I want you to know that we offer a series of courses, some of which are online and some of which are in person. At thehbotcourse.com, we'll include a link below. We have several courses available from training and certification in hyperbaric medicine, safety director, as well as a few different business implementation options to get the business up and running. So if you think that training and education would be helpful for you, take a look at thehbotcourse.com. Again, the link will be in the description below. Now back to our video. In those life-threatening and limb-threatening conditions, we're using very high, very aggressive pressures of oxygen and protocols. So two and a half atmospheres on 100% oxygen, sometimes two or three times a day for the first week or two. And we need to use very high pressures of oxygen and very aggressive protocols because these are very severe cases. Now, while there's much less research, in some cases, maybe not even any research to support using hyperbaric oxygen for other anaerobic infections, that doesn't mean it would be ineffective. In other words, 
if hyperbaric works from a mechanistic view on anaerobic infections that are this severe, wouldn't it also be reasonable to understand that hyperbaric oxygen would help other anaerobic infections? Not because it's the treatment for that disease, but because those are the same mechanisms of action that would be used in any case. And so these less severe, more chronic infections like Lyme or certain mold species or C. diff or H. pylori, these other very common, also severe, but more chronic in nature rather than life-threatening and limb-threatening, just devastating to our quality of life, but hyperbaric can also have those same mechanisms of suppressing the infection, suppressing the growth, creating an environment that's not conducive for that bacteria to thrive, while also improving immune system function, reducing swelling and inflammation, and also reducing the toxins that these bacteria species are releasing into our bodies. Now, from a protocol standpoint, we're using very aggressive protocols for these very severe conditions. It's also, in my opinion, likely that we can use a much broader range of therapeutic hyperbaric pressures of oxygen and frequencies and duration for these less severe and more chronic issues. Rather than two and a half atmospheres, two or three times a day for two or three weeks, maybe we ought to use 1.3 or 1.5 or 1.75 atmospheres on enriched oxygen. But instead of three times a day, maybe it's only once or twice a day in some cases, maybe literally only once a day, maybe only three or four days a week instead of seven days a week. I believe that it should be our goal to learn how to apply hyperbaric differently and how to match the intensity of our hyperbaric therapies to the severity of the cases that we're working with. And instead of only 10 or 12 treatments total, which in many cases is what's done on some of these severe cases, these are chronic infections. It's much more likely that we're going to be using this for one month or two or three months or even five or six months at a time, knowing that this slow and steady increase in oxygen over a period of time is going to help this person's body manage, deal with, and fight these chronic anaerobic infections. So this conversation on how or why should hyperbaric be considered with anaerobic infections, whether in the traditional model or in the non-traditional off-label use for other anaerobic infections, this comes from a textbook that we just finished writing. Dr. Joe DeTore and I just published The Art and Science of Hyperbaric Medicine. And in that book, we talk about mechanisms of action in detail, and we talk about protocols around mechanism of action because that's really how I want people to think about hyperbaric oxygen, to be as effective and as safe as we can be. There's also discussions on protocols in hyperbaric oxygen for certain conditions, anaerobic infections being one of them. But we cover close to 50 of some of the most commonly used conditions in hyperbaric medicine off-label and what those protocols should look like. So if that's interesting to you or that might help you in your practice, please click on the link in the description below and grab yourself a copy. Thanks again for your attention and we'll see you in the next video.